Now getting on with our subject, we will first define what is a decree. The scriptures record as follows, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. There are legal decrees, the decrees of the courts. There are laws that are passed by the legislature. But a decree is a law of your own being. Now the question that arises is, how do we establish this law in our own being? First of all, we must recognize that though the eyes may be the windows of the soul, and the ear is supposed to hear the voices of God, that a lot of people have stopped up ears, and a lot of people have eyes that do not see. However, the impressions of the world seem to make a great dent on most of us. What we hear carries into our world, but what we see carries more into our world than what we hear. I think most of you are aware of that. They say that a picture is worth thousands of words. First of all, we know that we are. We say, I am. You say, I am, don't you? Don't you say, I am well, or I am happy, or I am rich, or I am kind? You say these things. Well, who is this I am? Who is this? It's you, your being. But you were created by God. A lot of people have asked this silly question, who is God? The great masters have never answered this question because it is unnecessary to answer. When a man or a woman realizes God, they know the answer. No mere words could ever describe the experience of knowing God. So all paths are intended to lead man to God including the path of decrees. Now, what about prayer? Prayer is a method of contacting God. There are millions of people who pray. Prayers are in the main petitions. They're requests. It's asking God for something. How does a decree differ from a prayer? Does a decree Ask God for something? Of course it does. When you come out and decree, you are asking God for something. Well, isn't this the same as prayer then? Not quite. Because decrees are dynamic and rhythmic. They have a meter and a rhythm, and they are spoken in group dynamic form in most cases. And you multiply the power of the decree by the number of people that are in the room who are giving the decree correctly. Now I know that through the years, the masters know this too, and they know it far better than I do, that a lot of people have gotten mixed up over the matter of decrees. They have not understood what decrees are. And they come in cold to an ascended master meeting and they see a group of people all reciting in unison. Now I'll go ahead and have you recite in unison to show you what I mean. And you just imagine you're an outsider and you're coming into the first time and you're hearing this without understanding it. Now I'm going to explain it afterward for those of you who don't understand it. Let's say I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity, wait a minute, just a minute. They're so eager, they're like a bunch of racehorses at the stall. I mean, somebody has to fire the gun first, so I've got one up here. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. That's all. Now we're going to say that a few times. And we'll accelerate the rhythm, which I've done many times to show you. And then I'm going to explain it a little bit to the rest of you. Together. I am a being of violet fire. I am the 
of purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. Well, we've done this before. Now you come in, you've never seen this before. And you hear all these people shouting into the air. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. What in the world are these people doing? What strange practice is going on? This is perfectly natural. Well, they know you're talking, but they don't know why you're talking, and they don't know what you're trying to accomplish by this seemingly silly method. It isn't silly at all, as you know. And I have seen plenty of proof of that in my life, as many of you have. In fact, this house here is a manifestation, a total manifestation of decrees. And all that the summit is today was built up by decrees. Lives have been changed. People have been healed. People have had their minds quieted when they were disturbed. They have corrected family conditions. There is any number of things that have been done. There are so many things that have been done by decrees. You know, some of the churches today, they have testimony meetings where people get up and tell all that God has done for them. Well, we could have a testimony meeting and have people stand up and tell all that God has done for them through decrees and the power of decrees. And we'd have an awful lot of stories. I imagine the conference could go on for four days and nothing but testimonies of people in the audience that could tell all the things they've accomplished and that God has helped them to accomplish with decrees. So anyone that doesn't understand it, anyone that wants to laugh at it, anyone that questions it or doubts it, let them stop and think for a moment that if they were to go to med school to learn to be a doctor, that they wouldn't know all about human anatomy the first day of school. Well, I can assure you that there is almost as much to the science of decrees as to the human anatomy, perhaps even more. There's a lot to it, more than just words. I hope to be able to give you a little insight into the fascinating world of the decree as it is given in the higher octaves and of the meaning of vibration as vibration is conveyed through the universe by the power of decrees. I want to return to that thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. The whole thing is the relationship between yourself and God, but there's one difference in decrees that I want to introduce. As you know, back in ancient Egypt, Ikhenaten was the one who introduced the monotheistic concept of one God, practically to the planet. Prior to that time, man had a whole pantheon of gods. Aton became the one God, and he wrote hymns to Aton. Now, there are many people today that do not understand the fact that when God made man, he wanted to create a duplication of himself. Therefore, he made man in his own image, and he saw that that which he had created was good. Most people think that this is the physical body. They do not seem to think that God is a spirit, and that man was created in the spiritual image of God, with the likeness of God engraven upon his inner being. Therefore, in one sense of the word, as Jesus said to the people, when he made the statement, before Abraham was, I am, he said, you are condemning me for making this statement. He said, let me tell you that Moses spoke to the children of Israel and said, ye are gods. Now you can take that in two ways. In the possessive sense, where you say, ye are gods, that is, you belong to and are the property of God. Or you can take it in the sense that you are actually gods in manifestation. Now, it was this sense that Jesus meant it in. 
and that Moses meant it in when he said, ye are gods. Not that God possesses you, but that you are gods because you were made in his image and his likeness. Now here is the thing. Any number of men and women who descended from God and came down to this planet as you and I went through the vicissitudes of life and became victors over the world. And they ascended in light just as Jesus did from Bethany's hill. They went up and they are ascended beings, ascended masters. Every one of you should hope to ascend as Jesus did and no more be subject to the ills of the flesh and the struggles of moving a ponderous body about. But when you do, you will be part of God's pantheon, which is monotheistic. In other words, the pantheon of God is, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, followed by the words, it is not good for man to be alone. God created man or manifestation like unto himself because it is not good for God to be alone. Why should God sit on some supreme throne and just enjoy himself? So he created man by his creative power so that others could share in this throne, the three in one, throne, three, one. This is the unity of God midst the diversity of creation. So the pantheon that we're talking about here is the pantheon of many sons brought to captivity all linked to the one monotheistic God and therefore thou shalt have no other gods before me refers to the presence, the I am presence, the universal one God that we all have an individualized portion of. So I'm coming to a point that's very important in decrees here. In our decrees we have our preambles and every preamble as a rule starts out something like beloved mighty victorious presence of God. This is the universal God and the great central sun beyond the individualized I am presence. But it also has names in here of cosmic beings. I'll give you 70.18, you don't have to look it up. It starts out in the preamble of the decree. Beloved mighty victorious presence of God, I am in me, which relates the God to the God within. In other words, the God in the universe is related to the God in you. You have to sense this. If you just say these words in the preamble without sensing it, you will not be decreeing effectively. Then it goes on, thou immortal, that's important, thou immortal, unfed flame of Christ's love. Now you have to feed electricity into these lights. You have to feed oil into lamps. But you do not have to feed the immortal flame of Christ's love that is in your heart because it is an unfed flame. Burning within my heart, holy Christ selves of all mankind. Now, here we start. Beloved, mighty, Elohim, Arcturus. This is one of the seven spirits of God that is depicted in the book, The Prophet, by Khalil Gibra, as dancing in the palm of God's hand. It is one of the Elohim, the seven L's of creation, E-L. That's the Hebrew name for God. So we address here the beloved mighty Elohim Arcturus. Then we name, in many cases, other beings like Saint Germain, Jesus, and I'll take another decree here. I'll try to show you a little better. Here we are. Beloved Helios and Vesta, beloved Saint Germain, beloved mighty Portia, beloved seven mighty Elohim and directors of the elements, beloved Lord Tabor. Now this is the point. A lot of people reading these names in the decrees might feel because of Christian theology that they were in some way or other violating the word thou shalt have no other gods before me. I am pointing out to you that here we're dealing with a pantheon of humanity all of whom are created by God and it is no blasphemy for any of them to say I am God in the image of God. Do you understand what I mean? In other words, God made you in his image. It's not wrong for you to claim that and to acknowledge the divinity within yourself. Then it is not wrong to acknowledge the divinity within 
the God in all of these masters that are ascended. But they have proven their worth by their ascension. That is to say, they have gone up in light. They're free from mortal dross. What then do we mean by the term three times three, which is correlated here? When we say we're going to use the power of the three times three, first of all, I'll ask you mathematicians in this audience to say, what do you get when you say one times one? Tell me. One. But what happens when you say three times three? Nine. Isn't nine better than one? They say one with God is a majority. But I'm trying to show you that when you call upon these masters, you are actually invoking the light of God that is in them. And that is being added to the light of God that is in you. And every master you call on, so much more light are you receiving from those masters. One times one we have agreed on is still one. And three times three is nine. Well, what do you think it is when you have an audience of a thousand people all decreeing? Hmm? A million. There you are. We have a mathematician. A thousand people, it's squared into a million. So the thousand becomes much greater. Jesus said, and the point is back, the things that I do shall ye do, and greater things than I do shall ye do because I go to my Father. This refers to the adding power of universal love, that every time a soul ascends and wins their victory, that soul goes into the Godhead. You talk about the Baseball Hall of Fame, where you have all these baseball people, Babe Ruth and all these statues around. Imagine the Divine Hall of Fame, where you have Jesus, and you have Gautama, and you have Zarathustra, and you have Saint Germain, and all these great beings around this great pantheon. This is not a matter of worshiping strange gods or idols. These are living flesh, men in whom the Spirit of God has deified, raised them up in the same manner Jesus was raised up, and they have done greater things as Jesus foretold they would do because now they've gone back to the Father and they are right there in the Father's consciousness. The monotheistic God has only absorbed them and still let them retain their identity, which is the same thing that's going to happen to you and me. We're not going to be absorbed and made puppets. We're going to be absorbed by divine love because we become so saturated with it that the magnet of divine love is able to draw the bar steel right up to itself. Come home. You've got enough divine love now. Ascend. Come up. Come out of the socket of human error and come back home where I am. Well, then you see, you're a part of God, but you don't lose your identity. The only way you can lose your identity and be a castaway is to go ahead and go out into the exterior world and lose your soul in exterior things. Dissipate your substance. Destroy yourself. But when you come home to God in this manner, you don't lose anything. You gain everything. That's why Jesus said, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world but shall lose his own soul? Therefore, you must understand that when you come home to God, you have everything. And when you go to one of the masters, you're only getting what they have gotten. You see, each master has a quality that they externalize. That quality that they externalize blesses the whole universe. Saint Germain took the quality of freedom and he externalized it. Everywhere through the universe, wherever Saint Germain moves, a great radiation of freedom moves with him. Now, God himself is free, and freedom is one of the qualities of God. The only thing that happened with St. Germain is that he took that quality into himself and he made a greater focus of freedom in himself than in almost any other person that had ever walked the face of this planet. He just took that one quality of God. Now, when you make your decrees to these beings, do you realize what that means? It means that you are amplifying every quality that they have through yourself in a much greater manner than if you just lifted up your hands to God and said to the white light of God, well, I love you. Here you are taking the quality of freedom that comes through St. Germain. In this case, we'll say the violet flame ray. You're taking one segment of the white light and the whole thing is revealed in the mystery of Joseph's coat of many colors. Back in the Old Testament, 
where Joseph had the coat of many colors and he was the idle dreamer and he was sold into Egypt. Well, the many colored coat that Joseph wore is the seamless garment of the Christ where it becomes the white robe, all enfolding mankind, you see. Now, how does this all relate to decrees? It relates to decrees because you are appealing, first of all, to the mighty God presence. That's always the beginning of each decree. Beloved, mighty, victorious presence of God, I am in me. Then you're appealing to the externalized qualities of God in every ascended master. And you are multiplying that, you're squaring that power every time you do. So from an arithmetic standpoint, you're getting a great deal more power. Now you come to the body of the decree. Like charge, charge, charge throughout my four lower bodies. You are not just saying words, but you're scientifically planning words and relating it to your request to the deity, which is far superior to prayer. It's far superior to yogi. In yogi, I could turn around here and go into a certain yogic experiment, and sure, I can pull down the bliss of God. Some of you would feel it immediately. How many felt it? This is possible. This is divine love in manifestation. But here you're working with divine power, divine wisdom, and divine love in a decree. Through prayer, you can draw down divine love, the same as I did with a little yogi experiment there. You can put your hands together. You can say, oh, God, help me. And the mercy of God responds. The power comes down. You get power through yoga. You get power through prayer. You can get power through any number of means. But the quickest and the safest and the most beneficent power of all can be drawn through decrees because in audiences such as this, you're all squaring this power in one another. And when you square that power, it's absolutely amazing what actually happens. Now when you give a decree, you're not just giving it by saying words. If you are, you're making a tremendous mistake. When you make a decree, as I've told you before, you have to put the intense thought and feeling of your world into that decree. You're thinking people, but what do you think with? Consciousness, don't you? Can you think without consciousness? Can you think when you're asleep? Can you think if you're laying there as a corpse? I don't think so. You cannot think unless you are awake. Therefore, you're thinking people and you're also feeling people. You have feelings. If I step on your toes, it hurts unless you have a steel toe in your shoe. And if I say to you, I think you're an idiot, this hurts too unless you have reached a point where you're so impersonal that you don't take anything too seriously that anyone says. Then, of course, it probably doesn't hurt you. So people think and they feel. Well, most of the time, people are thinking and feeling in the human level through preconditioned ways of thought. Now I'm coming to a point where I want you to realize that if you say the word beloved, you've got to intensify your thought and feeling. When you say beloved, and you're giving a decree, you've got to pour your thought and your feeling into that word beloved. The word beloved is like a cake pan. But you've got to dump the dough in there and then bake it all at once. You see what I mean? You've got to put it in there. So you say beloved, mighty, victorious presence of God I am in me my very own. Now, you have to deal with imagery. You have to imagine yourself in a relationship to God. When you say, my very own, when I say that, I often reach out like as if I had arms that were so big they could take in the whole universe. And I see these arms coming back like this, and I'm hugging God. By, that's the image I get. I'm just trying to show you how you can do it. Let's try it once. 
Just put the feeling into it. Together. Beloved, mighty, victorious presence of God, I am in me, my very own. See what I mean? When you get that feeling that God belongs to you, just imagine what's happening to you. Well, here it is, right here. Here you are, right here is in the chart. And there is God, the son of your soul, right above you individualized in space. What actually takes place, and someday I think the scientists are going to be able to prove this to you. Right now they can x-ray people, you know, and see the bones inside of them. Well, someday they'll be able to measure the light that comes down. When you make your calls to God, there's an actual shower. And I'm talking about a shower just as tangible as the rain that you see out here that comes down on your roof. There's a shower of light, substance, just like masons and electrons and atoms, all these little particles of light, electrons, they just keep dashing down from God. And they carry a charge. Have you ever watched a construction project how they build roads and they have these big trucks and these big loaders and they pick up the dirt and they put the dirt into the trucks and the trucks go down the road and they come to a spot and they dump it? Well, all these electrons, all these little things, points of light, they're all carrying God's energy, just like the little dump trucks. And they're bringing that energy down into your world, just laden with blessings. You see what I mean? But you've got to invoke it, you've got to be conscious of it, and you've got to stimulate it. And to say words is really a sin. It's like I told you so many times before in different classes about the little boy that lived in an apartment next to me when I was a boy. And he used to say, Hail Mary, Mother of God, pray for us, pray for us. And went on like, I don't even know this, but I could hear him yet because he was going so fast that he reached a point where I think it took him about three minutes to do it when his father first taught it to him. And toward the end of the period that I recall, he was going so fast he'd get it done in about 30 seconds, the whole thing. And you could understand less and less of it. It was almost like our decrees, Beloved, mighty, victorious presence of God, I am in me, fold me down, I'm mighty, electronic, tube of ascending master, light substance. I mean, he was going like that, you know. He'd get it all over with and get it done with. But how much good did he do with it? Well, a lot of people come in and they see these decrees and they think, well, all we're saying is words. Now, I'm going to tell you something here during this class to all of you. Whether you like decrees or whether you don't like it, forget about it. Forget about whether you like decreeing or not. How do you know until you practice it a while? It took me nine months using the violet flame before I could accomplish a certain thing in my world that was important to me. But I kept on. How many people in here have kept on? How many people in this room at one time did not like decrees? I want to see. All right. How many of you people at one time didn't like it, like it now? All right. Now, the point I'm trying to bring out here is this, that you can change. And we hope to show you how to change because we hope to show you how to get a lot out of these decrees. So my point is, I noticed in the test decree that I gave you that a few of you were not decreeing. I want to tell you that I'm not angry with you or anything like that. For the purposes of this class, in order to help everybody else, I want you to know that if you don't decree during this class, that you will be like a whole hundred people here going down hill in a bobsled. And you're the only one that's dragging your feet. And you're going to slow up everybody in the place by not giving the decree. And you're going to hurt yourself and you'll damage the class to a degree. So I'm asking you, every one of you, whether you like it or not, at the beginning, please decree. Do what the other people are doing. If you can't put the feeling and thought into it, at least say it, because it's a start. Physical action is important. If you got a man attacking you on the street or attacking your wife out here, and you stand there and you think, you're not going to get away with this, you big bully. You're not going to get away with this. And he starts coming for you. You're not going to get anywhere. But when you put one foot forward, you say, <clears throat> Just make a noise or anything. Put your hands up. You've engaged in physical action. And physical action is important. It's very important because it precedes the other action. Now, a lot of people say, well, you think first and then you act. That's correct. It's the right way of doing it. But there is another way of doing it for people that haven't yet made up their mind.
and that's to act. So I'm going to ask everybody to decree, because this will mean more to you than you know now. I wouldn't lie to you. I wouldn't tell you this if it were not so. I have no purpose in it. You might like me better if I would say nothing about it. And I'm not trying to win friends and influence people for myself. I'm trying to win friends and influence people for truth and for God. And if I can't do that, I might as well quit. That's what we're based on, is truth. Now, I've mentioned establishing a matrix of words. A matrix of thought, a matrix of feeling. And what's going to happen with these decrees? When you keep giving them a long time, month after month, year after year, what's going to happen? What are you doing? Well, I'm going to tell you something. You can give these decrees from now till the cows come home, and they won't do you a bit of good if you don't do it right. But I'd rather see a hundred people and ten of them doing it wrong and have them all doing it than I would to see ten of them not doing it and ninety of them doing it. You see the point there. I want you all to do them. But I want you to do them correctly. And I wanted to remove from your minds, first of all, any idea that by appealing to an ascended master that you were making any blasphemy against God. There's no blasphemy against God in that. In fact, if God Almighty thought enough of that person to say, come up home, ascend into the atmosphere, and come back to my heart, and strip them of mortal dross, and these beings then have served from the invisible after their clean escape from the earth, they've come back here to serve you and me, and to serve the world, and again and again have given their energy and life to mankind. I think we ought to love those beings. They are the friends of the Christ, as Henry Van Dyke said, the helpers of the Christ. And that's what we're all aspiring to be. I'm sure none of you are particularly decreeing in this group here, like you take Louise Kininger here. She's in the front row, our beloved Regent Mother of the Flame. I'm going to introduce her to you a little more at the class of the Keepers of the Flame. But I'm sure that Louise is not interested, after she makes her ascension, in having you say, beloved ascended Master Louise Kininger. That's not her thought at all. I mean, she serves the Christ because she loves the Christ. And when she gets into the point where she's in the higher octaves, she is not going to respond to people because she wants her name called and she wants some form of glory for herself. She will be one of many, e pluribus unum, one out of many. The universe is unity. God is unity. God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Now then, when all these masters go up, they all become a part of one God because it came forth from one God. There was only one God in the universe to begin with, and he created all the things that exist within his own domain. People are also creators, you know, and they've done a lot of creating that is not compatible with the divine plan. And the black magicians have done a lot of creating that was not compatible with the divine plan. And we don't want any part of it. But it's here, it has to be contended with. So your decrees are very important. Now, what can you get by decreeing? You can be mentally disturbed. And you can calm your mind with decreeing until you will be absolutely calm. Somebody said, Oh, well, when I went into one of those decree classes, I got mentally disturbed. I wasn't disturbed before, but I got mentally disturbed. Well, I heard that from one lady one time, and she said this worked that way for a while. But after I participated and became a partner with it, then that changed, that the resistance seemed to arise because it was a strange practice. It is not a strange practice. It is, thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. And the word went forth. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God was the word. By him were all things made, and without him was nothing made that was made. 
This is the power of the Word. The Word is God. And the Word comes forth from God. And this is a very important point in the whole thing. When you decree, you have to realize that the Word is not coming forth from you, but from God. Well, this sounds very strange. People say, why should God appeal to a part of himself? Well, he's not. He's appealing to all of himself, and he's answering. Call unto me, and I will answer you. Well, how are you going to call unto God? Through prayer? Through decrees? Through what? Through consciousness. Therefore, the ingredient that's necessary in decrees is consciousness. I see people sitting in the audience that are unconscious. They're going like this. O God of love, thou God of gold, my true success you ever hold. In the hollow of thy hands flies mine by thy command. Come, come, come by all thy love. And they're not even thinking what they're saying. But if they say, O God of love, thou God of gold, my true success you ever hold. In the hollow of thy hands supply is mine by thy command. Come, come now by all thy love from thy treasure house above. And so on like that. Then they put the power into that matrix. It's not just volume. I can do it like this. Fortuna, God is of supply of all God's wealth from realms on high. Release thy treasures from the sun and now bestow on every one whose heart beats one with God's own light the power to draw from heaven's height. Abundance to expand the plan the masters hold for every man. Tune our consciousness with thee. Expand our vision now to see that opulence is meant for all who look to God and make the call. We now demand, we do command abundant manna from God's hand that now below as is above. All mankind shall express God's love. I don't have to scream it. I can say it, you can say it, and it'll work. It's a practical demonstration that works and you can feel it. Now when you say a decree properly, you're going to feel it. You're going to enter into it, and vision is important. Now take this decree, Fortuna, goddess of supply. When I say Fortuna, I know I'm talking to a divine being. This was a feminine master, a lady master that ascended. And her desire, all through her life, when she was embodied, was to see mankind have the glory of the golden ages. And all of her life, she thought of nothing but how to give mankind the true spiritual gold that would bring the flow of the material gold and all success into people's life. The sinister force, they went ahead and they created a false counterpart of Fortuna, the goddess of supply. And they call her Lady Luck. She haunts the gambling casinos of Monte Carlo in the invisible realm. And she is also known to the masters as fate, kismet, in the masculine form. This is wrong. This is a counterpart. It's not the real Fortuna. Fortuna is the goddess of good fortune, a real cosmic being. But Lady Luck, she is fickle, you understand. And she will play with you. She was very active during the crash of 1929 on the stock market. And she works with a suicide entity to try to bring people down into despair when they lose all that they've gotten, you see, through the power of lady luck. She's a counterfeit. She has a glitter like fool's gold. But the goddess Fortuna is radiant like the sun. She's dazzling. So you say Fortuna, when I say Fortuna, I see this dazzling goddess, similar to this Columbia Pictures, where they come on the screen in the movies and you see this goddess there and then there's light rays are sparkling from her. How many of you people, most of you know that, don't you? You've seen that sometime or another. I see Fortuna when I say it. I see her, and this draws her into my world. I say Fortuna, then I address her, who is she now? Goddess of supply of all God's wealth. And then I think of God's wealth. I think of the whole universe. I get a picture in my eye of the whole universe. From realms on high. Now up high doesn't have to mean up there because gold is often found in the earth. Which way is up? You tell me, Phil. <laughs> this is vibratorily speaking, it's up. From realms on high, 
Release thy treasures from the sun. Well, now we're getting either up or down, I mean, depending how you look at it. Release thy treasures from the sun. And when I say that, I see the sun in the heavens releasing light rays toward me. I see them coming, and they're just laden with golden treasures. And now I'll bestow on everyone, and then I go to my heart, and I get a tremendous feeling of love for the whole world. And I love all my enemies, and I love all the people on the earth, those I don't know of all countries and everywhere, and I send out, and now I'll bestow on everyone, and I allow that energy I've drawn from the sun to go out all over the earth. And I bless the whole planet with it. And then it suddenly gets more and more. It keeps getting more powerful then. Because God says, well now look, he's turned on all the taps and all the faucets in the universe. And I've just got to supply him with more hot water. So I mean they just naturally pour out more energy, you see. And this is what you can do. And then you go on whose heart beats one with God's own light. And then I feel my heart beating and I see it pulsating I see God's heart in the sun, and I actually see light rays expanding out like that, and then I feel the pulse in my heart. See? You don't just say the words, but you feel the pulse of it. You quicken yourself. You've got to use vision, and you've got to use feeling, and you have to do this along with the words. Otherwise, the words are like this. The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And it's the spirit you put into this that's going to make the decree. The people have no idea what we're involved in here. Most of you are familiar with a simple horseshoe magnet. You also know that there is a magnetic flux around the magnet which you can easily see by putting iron filings on a piece of glass and then you get the whole magnetic arrangement which will actually show its patterns on the glass. Isn't that correct? Another one over here. No, but I mean you know about the magnet and the glass. All right. He said he couldn't see it. He had that in kindergarten. Anyway, the idea of the flux is quite important to this because I can look at all of you here and I can put a glass over all of you and I'll find some people decreeing and they won't have any rearrangement of flux whatsoever. The iron filings will lay there just like they were dead. Others, I mean, they're jumping all over the board because there is a definite magnetism and attraction to the ideas that you want to convey. The decrees are matrices. They are scientifically planned by the masters and they will fulfill a certain purpose. Now I happen to know of people that have decreed for 20 and 30 years and I know some of these people that they can say one word and they could upset a whole room full of people because they've got that much power. That wasn't why they were given the power of decrees. This is something you have to be careful of. When you decree a lot, you draw a lot of power down from God. And you may have so much power, you can turn that power into the wrong use. Your anger, your ill feelings can become a terrible thing. You remember when Khrushchev took off his shoe? <laughs> And he got up there and he hammered in the UN. Do you realize that that vibration went all over the entire world? I'm not going to beat with my shoe. <laughs> I just wanted to show you, though, the idea of a man taking off his shoe and then hammering it and putting the vicious feeling that he put into that. It frightened people because he learned that as a boy. And a lot of people, when they're playing jacks, on a sidewalk. They learn how to throw feelings of ugliness at other children. You understand that? So when you decree a lot, remember that you have to be very careful that your decrees and your power of decrees doesn't enter into the matrices of your thought and feeling when you feel a little ugly towards something. Or you can take the power you've developed and put it into that. And who pays for it? You do. 
Oh, you can raise a lot of cane all over and all around you with this. That's not the purpose of it. We don't want to raise cane. We don't want to raise mutiny either. What we want to do, we want to develop divine qualities. And all of our decrees all the way through the book are slanted to that. They can make an ignorant person intelligent. They can make a person that is suffering from fear a fearless person. They can completely reverse any quality you have in your world if you do them the right way. I think we'll try some of these decrees briefly. Decrees, by the way, fall into many categories. They fall into many categories. Some of these decrees are world action decrees. They are designed to help the whole planet. Others are personal decrees for your protection, the protection of your family or your business. Some are decrees to increase your illumination. Some are decrees to give you more divine love in your world and more feelings of love. Some are intended to heal you. Some are intended to give you more money and other good things that you can use the right way. Some are designed to quicken the spirit of the resurrection in you so that the life force in your body will not be on the wane, but it'll be on the upgrade. Some is intended to work the ascension flame through your body so that when the time comes that you are considered for the ascension, that there'll be less residual substance in your four lower bodies. All of these flames are practical, but the violet transmuting flame is one of the most effective of all. The violet transmuting flame is one of the most important decrees for beginners, but it's just as important for people like me who has gotten off my feet, went down the road a little ways, and I'm still trying to keep on going, you see, like the hound of heaven. I'm being pursued and I'm pursuing God at the same time. He's chasing me and I'm chasing him. <laughs> Let's turn to 70.11. That's the violet section of your decree book. 70.11. Now I'll take the preamble first. This is a work session. And we're going to stop at the end. We'll do a little explanations together. In the name of the beloved, mighty, victorious presence of God, I am in me and my very own beloved, holy Christ self. I call to beloved Alpha and Omega in the heart of God in our great central Son, beloved Saint Germain, beloved Portia, beloved Archangel Zadkiel, beloved Holy Amethyst, beloved mighty Arcturus and Diana, beloved Kuan Yin, Goddess of Mercy, beloved Aramis and Diana, beloved Mother Mary, beloved Jesus, beloved Omri Tas, ruler of the Violet Planet, and beloved great karmic board, to expand the violet flame within my heart, purify my four lower bodies, transmute all misqualified energy I have ever imposed upon life, and blaze mercy's healing ray throughout the earth, the elementals, and all mankind, and answer this my call infinitely, presently, and forever. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I know you live all over your body, not just in your big toe. <coughs> your consciousness isn't centered just in the end of your finger. It's all over your body. Take a pin and stick it anywhere in your body. Make you a human pin cushion. And you're going to jump, right? Because your nerves are everywhere. But where do you really exist in your body? Everywhere. But your consciousness is flowing out through your body. You can deaden one limb with a narcotic and you won't feel anything in there. But it'll still be there. So you actually exist in your whole body, not just in any one part. And as you're a spirit, not just a body, you don't have to be limited to the domain of the body at all. The flame that's in your heart can penetrate out through the flesh form. And this is one of the things you have to learn to do. You have to learn to expand the flame, the power of the flame out through your body. 
and stop limiting yourself by saying, oh well, the flame might go out a quarter of an inch from me all around, or it might go out a foot. Throw that idea away. Start thinking in terms of your whole aura flooding the whole planet, as long as you're decreeing. But please keep your thoughts shut off from the rest of the planet if you're not thinking good thoughts. Keep the thoughts just somewhere inside of you and then transmute them quickly. But if you're thinking good thoughts, why not share them with the whole universe? So let the flame expand and realize that just like a radio antenna, this is not an antenna, just like a radio antenna though, radiates out and close at hand it'll light a light bulb and all of that, but further away you can't detect it unless you're tuned to its frequency. So you have to realize that all the good thoughts that you're thinking are going out into the universe and people who are in tune with it will be blessed with it. And it's a good idea. And it's a constructive idea because sometimes ideas join together. If you ever watched amoeba under a microscope, you'll maybe get some idea what I'm talking about. Sometimes one person's idea joins with another person's idea up here. Good ideas. Of course, bad ideas join together too, unfortunately. Somebody decided several years ago that they'd form a cartel. So they did. This was a little better than just an ordinary corporation. And you know, if you kept on working in the business world with the structures that they had a few years ago, wouldn't have been long before you'd have just had one credit card and there'd been one company you'd do business with. We live in a world today where God has permitted diversification in order for people to have experience and outwork their karma. You people have to realize that. I like to, uh, right in the middle of this decree, I'm going to go over here, because these ideas come to me, I'm going to catch them while they're hot off the griddle. Here you have a dot in the center of a television screen. And after you turn the set off, have you ever noticed how the whole thing goes down to that little dot? Well, that's where it came from. Isn't that right? It started with that dot. And your linear, your lines that run across horizontal, they were all created on the screen as that dot diffused and the whole stream of electrons started moving rapidly across the whole tube as it fluoresced. Now that is a form of diversification. That's diversification. But when you snap the power off and take it off the field of the screen, it goes down and goes back to the point where it started from, which is the point where the stream of electrons hits on the screen at first. Isn't that right? And then it goes back and pretty soon the filament cathode and all this has lost its power and turn, it goes out. And then you lose this little dot. There's nothing there. I'd like to go into something else on that, about the pralayas and the manvantaras, but without getting into the Hindu aspects of it, I'll just say this, that the light, the sun in the center of that little screen, you see, spreads all the way across the field. That's like the space-time continuum. And all this diversification that comes in a manifestation in the world is for karmic purposes. If you were scalped by Indians and Indians owe you a karma and there are no more Indians, how are you going to get your vengeance back from the Indians? The Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. You understand what I mean. It has to work that way. There has to be a law behind it all. And there is a law. We have diversification. But what God is interested in is people getting all worked out here, getting their debts paid and getting back home to him because this is not really a happy situation in this world. When we get hot, we have to air condition. When we get cold, we have to heat. When we get tired, we have to rest. And if we get too rich, we'd have to worry about it by either giving it away or losing it with taxes, one or the other, something. There's always something to counterbalance everything. So we have to realize that all these ups and downs are here to instruct us and to teach us. We have to learn something from them. 
we don't, it's just too bad. Now we come back to the violet flame here, which is the cure for all these ills, because it will strip us of all negative feelings. Oh, how I wish I could have a six-hour session with you on this subject where I could develop this whole thing, because I see so many points here that it staggers my imagination. It's just staggering. Well, anyway, I would like some time to be able to discuss with you the introduction of disease lines into the human frame and show you how the origin of disease is usually within the electronic framework of man. I'd like to be able to show you that, but I don't have the time to develop it. And I'd like to show you it for the simple reason that I could then explain to you how the violet flame works as curative effect, as well as curative cause. Gives effect and cause both in curing and correcting conditions that people have in their bodies and in their minds because it introduces a superior pattern which causes the flux patterns that are distorted. The distorted flux patterns in people's electronic body are corrected because the violet flame is so powerful that it lines them up just as chiropractors line up people's spines, you know, by putting things back in place so the nerve currents can flow. So the decrees, if they're done right, they create the proper patterns of electronic flux. That's flow, another word for flow. I don't know why we have to be so sophisticated that we use these bigger words, but it's customary because, you know, most lectures want people to think they know something. But actually, all it amounts to is it's the flow. The electronic flow, the pattern of that flow, when it's the violet flame, is constructive. And it lines up everything else with it, and you feel so much better after you do it that you don't know what in the world happened to you. You wonder why you feel so good. And it soon dissipates away because you haven't developed the storehouse in your body and cells and mind to store this energy from the decrees. But after you do it for years, nature seems to develop a storehouse where you can be all prayed up or all decreed up for a little while. At least it'll work a little longer than for some people when they first start. So remember, you have a whole world to discover in decrees. A world. Now I think we better do some or I'll get lost here in the fog of my own mental miasma. <laughs> it's like the preacher down in Mississippi said he would speak upon the indubitable angelic acclamation of the ineffable austerity of the approaching woes on Sunday and on Wednesday, he would speak on the uncontrovertible inexhaustibility of divine providence. <laughs> I don't know whether he knew what he was talking about or not. So I think we better do some decrees, and then we'll find out what we're talking about. We'll go on with this now. Continue through the violet flame section. Together. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. Stop a minute. I want to show you something. This is where I bring in the rhythm. Now it goes like this. I am the violet flame in action in me now. I am the violet flame to light alone I bow. I am the violet flame in mighty cosmic power. I am the light of God shining every hour. I am the violet flame blazing like a sun. I am God's sacred power freeing everyone. There is a beat in it. Every decree has a beat. Like here's one over here. Goes like this. Charge us with thy violet flame, charge, O oh, charge us in God's name, anchor in us all secure, cosmic radiance make us pure. You people who are not familiar with this, pick up the beat from the audience. And the beat is important because the rhythm will cut through the lines of force that are in the atmosphere carrying all kinds of human thoughts of sickness, disease, death, misery, Vietnam, and all kinds of things. Fear of this and fear of that. That's in the atmosphere of the whole planet, same as radio waves are going through here. We've got a, probably a thousand television stations going right through this room right now, and God only knows how many radio stations, plus all the people's thoughts that are able to project their thoughts out blazing through space. 
Of course, thank God for the folks of purity here, that a lot of that is cut out when you come in here. But if it wasn't for the focus the masters had put here, you'd have a lot more of it to handle, I'll tell you that. So I want you to pick up the beat and the rhythm because that's what stops the black magicians from interfering with your decree. And when you pray, they can interfere much easier, you see. Because you just say, dear God, please help me. But sometimes your fear will go up and form a loop. And your fear will catch your prayer before it gets very high and draw it right down. And you'll feel a solar plexus action because you're afraid. The things I have feared come upon me. And you get frightened over something when you pray a lot of times. But a decree, if you decree before you pray, your prayers will go up higher. <laughs> this is true. Now I'm going to skip this one. I'm going to start with the next page. And we're going to go all the way through it properly. I'm going to see how good you've learned your lessons today. Together. In the name of the beloved, mighty, victorious presence of God, I am in me, my very own beloved, holy Christ self, and the entire spirit of the great white brotherhood, I decree. Radiant spiral, violet flame, descend now, blaze through me. Radiant spiral, violet flame, set free, set free, set free. Radiant violet flame, O come, drive and blaze thy light to me. Radiant violet flame, O come, reveal God's power for all to see. Radiant violet flame, O come, awake the earth and set it free. Radiance of the violet flame, explode and boil to me. Radiance of the violet flame, expand for all to see. Radiance of the violet flame, establish mercy's outpost here. Radiance of the violet flame, come transmute now all fear. And in full faith I consciously accept this manifest, manifest, manifest. And in full faith I consciously accept this manifest, manifest, manifest. And in full faith I consciously accept this manifest, manifest, manifest. Right here and now with full power, eternally sustained, all powerfully active, ever expanding and world unfolding till all are holy ascended in the light and free. Beloved I am, beloved I am, beloved I am. Now, I'm going to give you a little more instruction on this one we just gave. In the name of the beloved, mighty, victorious presence of God, I am in me. When I say that, I get joyous all over. I don't know if you can get the feeling of how it feels to be dancing under Niagara Falls, but if you can just imagine God coming down all over you in great torrents, and then you get happy, you just want to jump up, you see, like you see some of these religious people, the shouting Methodists and the Pentecostal people, you know, where they jump all around, you see. Well... You don't have to jump around, you can control it, but you can still feel it. You can feel the wonderful presence of God, you see, and you can be joyous. And you have to have that joy because joy is the motor of life. St. Germain has told us that. And if you don't have joy, the motor of your life is not going to be turning. So we have to do it that way. So when we say in the name of the beloved, mighty, victorious presence of God, you see, I mean, you're just so happy that the presence of God is here. Just stop for one moment and think if the light of the universe went out. Where would you be if God went out? Where would you be? Hmm. Be like that television screen and just go down the little dot and then that would fade out. And we wouldn't be anymore either. It's like the poem that goes like this. It says that they would fold their tents and silently steal away. We'd be awful silent. My very own beloved Holy Christ Self. The Holy Christ Self is the universal Christ. A lot of people had the idea that Jesus, the man, was the only begotten Son of God and they didn't understand that he was speaking of the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of all mankind. And the only thing that could save mankind is that which produced mankind to begin with, the Word. That's why in Revelations, it says, I saw a man coming out riding a white horse, and he had a vesture dipped with blood, and on his vestments were written these words, the Son of God and the Word of God. By him were all things made, and without him was nothing made that was made. What does that mean? It means the universal Christ, the light of God, the only begotten of the Father. God would not create just one fleshly man and say this man is the only savior of the world because he created all men in his own image. So we're talking to the universal Christ. We all have to drink into him. And when we drink into this universal Christ, we'll be like Jesus or Christ-like. So all it means, it's a bunch of foolishness that has 
confused the whole world by false theology, tried to make us think wrong. We all have responsibility for ourselves. It is up to us to carry the ball, so to speak, not to expect someone else to carry it for us. The contribution of our beloved Jesus is immense. It's one of the greatest contributions that's ever been made, but he himself said, greater things shall ye do. He doesn't want us to stop. No master, no chila of a master wants people to stop. You know, there's some voice teachers in New York and various places that teach voice, and they have opera singers that they've trained, but they can't sing at all. But they want their students to do the thing that they were unable to do. And any master that has the love of God in him, he wants people to do things that will transcend himself. Greater things shall ye do, because I go unto my Father. I go unto my God and unto your God. Now we'll take this radiant spiral violet flame. I just went through that with you. When you say radiant spiral violet flame, descend now blaze through me. Do you know what radiance is? What is radiance? Expansion of light, yeah. But it's brilliant, isn't it? It just glows. Radiant spiral. And you see this going in spirals around yourself. I pity the people that dream of a linear universe, that cannot conceive of the law of the cycles and the spirals. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. How would you like to draw an infinite line? You have to deal with spirals. Even God has dealt with spirals. That's why you have miles of intestines in your body, which I hope you'll soon fortify. <laughs> now we'll give 70.13, violet flame from the heart of God. Now, when you come to this, this is going to be a beat decree again. I want you to concentrate on this violet flame, which I've hidden so lovely up here. Can you see it now? And then you realize that the violet flame, which is a gift of God, came forth from God's heart. So you say, violet flame from the heart of God. Violet flame from the heart of God. You see what I mean? You have to get that accentuation in there in your own consciousness if you don't want to do it outwardly. Violet flame from the heart of God. What's more lovely than the thought of the heart of God? So let's say this together in joyous anticipation. Violet flame from the heart of God. Violet flame from the heart of God. Violet flame from the heart of God. Expand thy mercy to me today. Expand thy mercy to me today. Expand thy mercy to me today. Violet flame from the heart of God. Violet flame from the heart of God. Violet flame from the heart of God, transmute all wrong by forgiveness ray, transmute all wrong by forgiveness ray, violet all wrong by forgiveness ray, violet flame from the heart of God, violet flame from the heart of God, violet flame from the heart of God, blaze into action through all the state, blaze into action through all the state, blaze into action through all the state, violet flame from the heart of God, violet flame from the heart of God, violet flame from the heart of God, oh mercy's flame for air holds way, oh mercy's flame for air holds way, oh mercy's flame for air holds way. Violet flame from the heart of God, violet flame from the heart of God, violet flame from the heart of God, sweep all the earth by Christ's command, sweep all the earth by Christ's command, sweep all the earth by Christ's command, violet flame from the heart of God, violet flame from the heart of God, violet flame from the heart of God, thy freeing power I now demand, thy freeing power, demand thy freeing power I now demand. Take dominion now, to thy light I bow, I am thy radiant light, violet flame so bright, grateful for thy ray, sent to me today, fill me through and through until there's only you. I live, move, and have my being, gigantic fiery focus of the victorious violet flame of cosmic freedom from the heart of God, great central sun, and our dearly beloved Saint Germain, the God of freedom for the earth which forgives, transmutes, and frees me forever by the power of a three times three from all errors I have ever made. Beloved I am, beloved I am, beloved I am.